Hi everybody. Today we have my DevCam and DevConf project IPCFG network configuration socks with Wouta Berthers. And let's enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, it says DevCamp and DevConf, which is also what's on the schedule. Unfortunately, I didn't find as much time during DevConf, so maybe I should have changed the title, but I decided that was just not worth it. So this is what I've been doing for most of DevCamp. I've been neglecting all the things that I promised other people to do um, because I thought this was really worth it, and I'm hoping to convince you that I'm right with that. So we'll see. Um, f I'll, in this talk, I'll first talk a bit about where I got the idea of doing something like this. Uh, it's a fairly long story. Well, I'll keep it short, but it's a fairly long story. Uh, then I'll give you a bit of a theory on how it's supposed to work, um, how I thought uh, this to do this. Uh, third point is a bit of status. How far did I get in uh, implementing this? And finally, I'll reflect a bit on things that I think might jeopardize uh, the project as I'm implementing it. Um, I don't expect many risks, but there are some, and I'll uh, tell you which one is there. Uh, if at any point during the presentation you have a question, please do not hesitate to ask me immediately, because otherwise you might forget, and that would be a shame. Thank you. So, a um, little bit of history. I've been thinking about this for quite some time. In fact, the first time I thought some about writing some network configuration tool, and this was just a very vague idea that maybe I might want to do this someday, was on my way to Helsinki for DEPCON 5. Um, because I was with a bo borrowed laptop at the time, and I hadn't done the configuration, and it was a lot of work, and I was like, why do I have to do this manually? And so over the next few years, I gave it some thought, but I didn't actually do anything, and then there was someone called Martin Kraft, who I'm sure you all know, thinking about, let's do something called NetConf. And I was like, yes, that is fairly close to the, what I had been thinking. So I, during the presentation at FOSDEM, where he introduced this idea of implementing this, I thought, I, I gave him a few things that I thought were important. Um, if you review the video of that presentation, you will actually see me sitting there and making some notes. Um, and I thought, this is good. I don't have to do anything anymore. Unfortunately, next year, as you probably also all know, uh, that didn't actually turn out to work because uh, Martin gave up in 2008, the next year. Um, so that revived my idea. I did first try to help him out with NetConf in building a C version of that Python code, but as it's not very much a secret, I'm not a very much a fan of, a fan of Python, so I didn't get very far with that. So in 2009, I started working on what I called IPCFG. And the first version that I started writing then was, well, could be described as a Turing machine of function pointers. I hear some of you laugh. Um, if that is because you think it's a bad idea, then I fully agree. <laughs> it was a very bad idea. Um, one of the main issues with it was that um, you couldn't easily extend it because it was impossible for any module to discover what the structure of, of this Turing machine was. Uh, the second problem with it was that it couldn't do if down. Um, it could do if up, you could bring the network up, but you couldn't bring it down again, which was a bit of a problem. Um, I tried to f remedy that second problem with uh, my first rewrite in 2010, that was around December, I think. Um, and I tried to, well, basically what I did there was add another function pointer, but that didn't really solve the basic problem that you couldn't discover what the structure was. So that only took about a month or two before I gave that up as well. And I basically, I totally gave up on the project until sometime last year when I started working with Puppet for a customer. And I was like, yeah, this model actually works. You have an, an abstract model which is built into a graph and it applies it to the system and it actually works. And I was like, why don't we do something like that for network configuration? Um, and I tried to talk myself out of it like, yeah, it's not because it works for Puppet, that's gonna work for network configuration, but I couldn't really find a good argument why it couldn't work. So I started playing with things, and um, basically uh, in, in June of this year, I started doing a little bit of work, and on the, on the flight here, and especially during Depp Camp, I've done quite a lot, tried some work, and I've gotten, well, not, not to something that's ready, but I think it's something that has much promise. Um, now, why do I think this is necessary to build yet another network configuration tool? Um, there are many tools out there. Um, I, if up down is one, network manager is one, wicket is one, 
there are some others. I, I will come to, back to that on that in a minute. Um, but why is it important to, to do this? Is, aren't, they, aren't there enough tools already? And I think the answer to that is no, because none of them actually implement everything that the configuration tools should do. And I'm, a, I'm sorry to say, but I think the Windows implementation, while not perfect, is actually better than what we have anywhere in Linux. Um, so I listed a few things that a network configuration tool should do, in my opinion, um, and there are a fair number of things. And the first of one is uh, boot time configuration. Things like bring the network up at boot time before any user has logged in. If Updown is very good at that. You configure some stuff, and if Updown will bring it up. A second point is roaming configuration. This is not used for servers and desktops like the first one, but it's more used for laptops. It can be used on servers and desktops, but it's not really what uh, they focus on. Uh, roaming configuration is something very useful for a system like a laptop that is changed from network one network to another all the time and would need quite some user input to, uh, to be changed. Uh, network Manager, Wicked are examples of software that do that really good. Um, a network configuration tool might have to deal with just one link or might have to do with more than one link. Um, a server, typically, a router, typically, will have to, have to deal with at least two links. Uh, a laptop usually doesn't have to do that unless it's my laptop, in which case it fairly often has to do that when I... Uh, oh, yeah, well, somebody on IRC notices that he didn't know Martin abandoned NetConf. Well, he did, actually, so... He told me so in person. Um, so basically, um, yeah, si single and multiple network configuration links is, is something that a network tool may have to deal with. If you're a router, you have at least two network links. If you have a laptop, you probably don't. Um, I sometimes configure a second link because I'm installing a server and I want to do some DHCP there. And, and if I use something, something uh, uh, interactive like a network manager, it brings the other link helpfully down because I, I have a second link there, which is not very useful. Um, but I think it shouldn't stop there. Once a tool has, done, has brought a network link up, um, it, there's more things involved than that. I give a few examples here. A proxy server for your web browser, uh, an SMTP smart host for uh, mail user agents that talk directly to an SMTP smart host, uh, an online status in uh, an instant, instant messenger uh, application. These are just a few examples of things that may need to change in the user environment. Um, if you're using a down, that's not going to happen. If you're using Network Manager, that can happen. A network Manager can actually uh, notify some applications that it's there, but um, it, it's usually somewhat optional. Um, and finally, some manual configuration. A tool should deal with that properly. With manual configuration, what I mean is things like you manually say IP address add something to this interface. Um, if I do this and I've got Network Manager or Wicket running, then they will helpfully remove it again because that's not active and we don't need that. Um, if you use if up down, that works. If up down will ignore what you did and it will ignore it so much that if you say bring all my network down, that bit is still up because it doesn't know about it. Um, I think both are failure cases. Both should be handled more properly than is currently the case. So, Given a f little overview of what I think is involved in network configuration. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, there are two other things that occurred to me with that list. One mm -hmm. is um, VPN. Right, is, yes. Um, uh, virtual machines. So especially if you've got a, a host that has like a DOM zero host in Zen terminology with multiple virtual Good machines point. and Good point. Yep. bridge interfaces, um, right. those types of things. To me, that is, um, it's on a different level than what I was thinking about, but yes, those are also things that a network tool should do. Um, and I'm happy to say that my uh, framework should allow it to do such things, although the current code isn't able to do that yet, but that's a different matter. So is there a perfect ma network management tool? Um, well, I've no named a number here. This is not just an arbit arbitrary number. These are all tools that I've used myself at some point in the past. Um, some of them, like Network Manager, has been several years ago, and I don't know much about it anymore, but I've actually used all these. Um, so if up down is good at, like I said, boot time configuration, um, but it doesn't actually do much more than, uh, more than that. If, if you... Uh, if you 
uh, don't have a network interface there which is configured, it will just ignore it. Also at shutdown time, which may be a bad thing. Network manager doesn't do uh, boot up time, which makes it useless for people like me who use PAMP Kerberos, because um, it only gives you network once you are logged in. So if your PAM module needs network to log in, you can't use it. Um, Wicket fixes that, but otherwise has the same issue as Network Manager, in that it only does one network link. It disables all the network links, if you have them. Um, it will automatically say, oh, there's another one, so we don't need this one anymore. Uh, and then there's GuestNet and Where Am I. GuestNet and Where Am I both have fully programmable um, configuration files, uh, file formats. GuestNet is an extension to the if up down, which will dynamically change your network configuration based on where you are, on what hosts it see, sees, which makes it somewhat more dynamic, but at a cost of making it significantly harder to configure. And um, it doesn't actually allow you to dynamically add things by just using a, a GUI. It's all configuration file. Where am I is, um, has some features that GuestNet has, but one important feature it misses is that it has bad uh, interaction with if up down, so it will break your network in all sorts of interesting ways if you use that, um, not wisely. So, is there a perfect network management tool? In my opinion, not really. They all have their flaws, they all have their strengths, um, but as it is right now, you have to use one tool on this kind of system, the other tool on that kind of system, which makes it, well, you, you need to remember extra things that you wouldn't have to remember if we could just use one tool for everything. So, with that um, out of the way, I think I should explain how it works in detail. I've given a little insight on that. Um, but how does it work if in detail is fairly, well, not too complex. But really, how, basically, how do all network configuration tools work? Um, they all pretty much do the same thing. At first, they will probe the system for what the current configuration is. This probing may involve reading something from the kernel, or it may involve, as in the case of if up down, reading something from a state file, but they will all check what the current system uh, sa state is. Then they will decide what to do. Um, is this bringing up a network interface, doing nothing, or bringing it down again? That depends on what the user asked and what the configuration file says, but they need to make some decision, and finally, make an actual change. Um, Probing is fairly simple. You just ask something from some data from the kernel, and you've, you know what you need to do. D doing the actual change is also fairly simple. You write some data back to the kernel, and the kernel will magically alter your network configuration uh, stuff. The hard part is actually making the decision. And there are some strategies involved, um, I mean, some available strategies that you can use to, to make that decision. First decision is, well, you just do what the config files say. Or, in other words, you don't actually make any decision because if the config file is wrong, then your network is broken. Um, that's what if up down does. If you have a, a, st a stanza there that says bring ETH0 up and you don't have a cable plugged in your ETH0, then if up down at boot time will just sit there for half a minute or longer until it decides that, well, there's probably not a DHCP server on this, on this non existing network, um, which is not very useful. Uh, you can uh, also do something like Network Manager or Wicket, which basically has hard-coded rules about the network. It's fairly dynamic in that if you enter something, it will respond on that. But the rules used for deciding what to do uh, with the user input and with uh, the system uh, state that is available, those rules really are fairly hard-coded. It's impossible to say, um, I want to add something else to this if it's not really pre-programmed into Network Managers. The third option is programmer co pro programmable config files, um, such as GuestNet and Where Am I, where basically all the decision making is left to the user and the programs themselves don't actually have to do much about decision making. Um, that's all. They have all of their strengths and downsides, but my question really is why don't we do, do, try to do all of them in one system? Um, you can have a, a configuration file that allows you to say, don't do anything beyond what's here. You can have defaults that will kick in if you don't have any configuration file. Currently, if you don't have a conf configuration file for if up down, what it will do is simply nothing. You won't get any networking. I think good tool should try, not too hard, but try to some extent to get some working networking 
by default configuration. How I see this is if you have a link on a network interface, it should by default try to DHCP of that link, so you at least have some, some attempts at a, at a network. Um, and for really advanced users, having a programmable config file could also be useful. I don't see why we can't do all three at the same, at the same time, and that's actually what I'm trying to do. So how does IPCFG work behind the scenes? Um, and this is where it gets slightly technical. Um, I see Ben saying not just probe, but also monitor. Yes, of course, and that's also something that I should do. This is also reading the kernel state. So how does uh, IPCFG work? It starts by building a directed graph. Um, for those of you not familiar with that term, uh, graph theory is a fairly extensive subset of uh, mathematics in which you basically have a system built on nodes, which are states, and edges, which are transitions. Um, so I thought, why not build a network graph, a directed graph of the network state? And if any node in this graph can mean a particular state. And I've got a number of examples here of what these states could, could be. Uh, for instance, uh, as we could have a node representing the state that E0 has been brought up, and we don't know what state WN0 is in, uh, because we haven't checked yet, or uh, because the check is running, anything like that. A second node could be E0 is up, um, and we don't actually care about WN0. That means, may mean we may have or we may not have checked, but if there is a change in WLAN 0, we're not going to change anything because we're still in our node uh, as described by this, by this thing. So there's a little difference between the two first, and I think it's fairly, very important. There is an internet connection coming from somewhere, from some node, is a third one, and one that I think could be a good default. Um, if we try to reach that as a, as a default uh, configuration in IPCFG, you have a fairly useful network configuration at boot up, um, without trying to break the system completely. Um, for a server, the fourth node could be useful. ETH0 and ETH1, both, are fully configured and have a route, and then we can do some load balancing over the two, or bonding, or I don't know what, um, but this could be a useful network state for a server. Or finally, we could have something saying ETH0 has a static IP address configured and everything else is down. Uh, in this case, we would not allow WLAN 0 to come up. If it does come up, we would bring it down immediately again. Final, uh, next point are the edges. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe the microphone. Sorry, something that comes to my mind immediately when you said these are states is that the amount of states you will have to take into account will be huge, like unmanageable. Yeah, um, I gave some examples here. Um, Yes, if, we, if I do implement it this way, it would be huge. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I will, in fact, implement all possible states. Uh, it will depend on what the user wrote as configuration. If the user doesn't actually define any configuration similar to this one, then we probably won't have such a node in the graph. Um, the system will only have, but I'll, I'll come to that, back to that in a, in, in a bit. The system will only have nodes um, that are actually useful to reach states that are wanted. So if there is no state that is wanted which depends on, uh, on that node, on that second node, then we don't see it in the system. So yes, otherwise the graph would get unmanageably uh, large, and I'm trying to avoid that. Yeah, Gunnar? Thanks. Well, yeah, uh, just uh, adding to this that you may have too many states. Thinking about servers uh, running virtual machines where each virtual machine has a a, a tune interface to, I mean, that, mm -hmm. that can lead to really too many possible states and interfaces. So. Yeah, it's possible. Um, it's something to be thought about, um, but like I said, we, uh, I'm, I'm certainly trying to, to reduce the number of uh, available states, but I do think it's useful to have this kind of, of, of uh, stuff. Anyway, uh, edges would be transitions, as said, so an edge would not have any uh, ability to, to check whether it is in the current state. It would just simply know um, my previous state would be something like that and my next state would be something like that. And um, I need to uh, perform these few system calls to make sure the, the edge is transitioned. So that's just basically making the changes. So the algorithm of changing the network configuration in uh, this uh, 
model would then be first we mark the current state. Um, we, we check, we ask every node, are you currently in your state? And we find the node which says, yes, I am, in, I, I am active, but I have no uh, edges pointing out of me that point to nodes which are also active. That node is assumed to be the current state. Then we mark candidate wanted states. Um, wanted states, so candidate wanted states are states that are desirable either through configuration or through default as a state we want to go to. Um, and they are scored. Uh, by default, uh, states with higher bandwidth would get a higher score than states with lower bandwidth. Um, so we score them, we order them, we find a sh the shortest part from the current state to the wanted states by using Dijkstra's shortest path. Uh, and then finally, we just walk the path leading to the highest scored state. Go ahead, Rene. Another short remark. Um, and when you say the bandwidth used as, a, as the after marker for the edge, uh, there is, you might like to take into account stuff like, for example, uh, in certain situations, I don't want to use this interface because it's yeah, too expensive. Yeah. I said by default, the bandwidth would uh, have an influence on the score. But the plan would, of course, be that you could influence that score from the configuration file. Of course. Yeah, sure. So finally, you would then make a change and uh, yeah, apply your changes by walking the path through the, through the graph. Um, so that's a big outline of how the system would work. Um, what I haven't said is um, to, to do this shortest path is um, the, the edges would uh, have an estimate function so they can say well I think it's likely or unlikely that I will be able to, uh, to, 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 to be transitioned that I will be able to, to, to walk there. It can also say it is impossible. I know that it will not be possible to do that. And this will be used to decide whether or not we will be able to reach a node on the other side of that path. Um, so if we also, if we do actually try to walk a path and we find that even though we thought we might have been able to transition over an edge, that we've, we find that this isn't, isn't actually possible, we will then try to recalculate what the, the best uh, way out of there is. Uh, if we find, after transitioning all the paths, that we don't end up at one of our wanted states, um, the, the plan is that the, the current state at the begin of, beginning of the process is also marked as a wanted state with, with the lowest priority. So if we don't manage to end up at a useful state, we just revert back to the original state again. Which might mean that your network is fiddly for a while, but eventually it should st still work again. Right, status aka when, I've had why, how, now we're going to when. Um, what if I implemented, I've implemented the full graph, I've implemented default nodes implementation and default edge implementation. I have implemented path mapping, so we can actually walk the path, uh, the graph. I'd, I've done some non-default nodes on Linux, um, MIR detection, I mean, it can detect that we have a cable plugged into a network and decide whether or not to walk that path. I have spent, I think, two and a half days writing a parser for ETC network interfaces. That thing is a bitch to parse, but it works. Um, I have written a domain-specific language for defining defaults. Um, I can actually show you that to you. Uh, except that this will be unreadable, so I'm not going to do that. <coughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's fairly simple. It just decides that this uh, explains that for a node with this name, you need to use that implementation. Uh, if you want to instantiate it, you need to have a node with that name. Um, and to get in there, you have to use this edge or that edge and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I've written a very basic command line interface, but that still needs a, a whole lot of work. It's really not ready yet. What's well, not ready? Um, many, 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 many node and edge implementations. Um, I've written a few basic ones to just to prove that I think it will be possible. But before this can actually be useful, we need to have nodes for um, IPv6, for I static IP addresses. We need to have nodes for DHCP. We need to have nodes for auto uh, detection, uh, auto configuration. We need to have nodes for uh, legacy IP, aka IPv4. We need to have nodes for DHCP v4. And well, we need to have loads and loads of nodes and edges. 
Um, so that's something I will be working on once the, the basic framework is completely ready, which is almost there, but not entirely. I need to have a native configuration file format. Its network interfaces has the inherent implement, uh, limitation that it is written for if up down, and uh, it can't do, you can't describe more in there than you can do with if up down, and I want to be able to do more with if up down, so I need a separate uh, file format. Um, by the way, this is approximately in the order that I am planning to implement it. Uh, the third one is a feature that I've been thinking about and I think would be fairly useful, which I call IPCFG record. The idea would be if you call that, um, then IPCFG would dump a config file representing the current state of the network, of the network configuration. So you could then write that config file to some file, and then after reboot, you could just say IPCFG with that config file and just apply the network state so it's still, so it's back to what it was before I rebooted. Uh, and I think that could be very useful. Um, after that, I'm thinking about doing a daemon mode in which the system would detect changes and automatically uh, dynamically reconfigure the system as network manager would do. And of course, the user tool, user level tool uh, to talk to the daemon. Um, finally, some risks, things that I think might be problematic, also known as e uh, what could jeopardize this? First of all, it's implemented in D, because I think D is a very interesting language. It has some features that um, other languages don't have yet. It's still, it's not a scripting language, it's, it's a compiled language, so you can actually boot into it. But there are a few minor issues with D. For instance, um, currently D compilers don't exist for non-X86 architectures. This is being worked on. Well, sorry, compilers exist, but the standard library doesn't exist. Um, the reason for that is that D has recently seen some uh, architectural changes and the old D1 library is available for all Debian architectures, um, except the Hurt, I believe. But um, whereas the new D2 language is currently only available for uh, x86 architectures. Like I said, it's being worked on. I expect this to be ready by, by uh, Wheezy plus one, so that shouldn't be an issue, but I mean, I'm not working on it, so it might still uh, be a problem. There is currently no ABI in D for shared libraries. That is, D programs can open shared libraries, but they have to use the C ABI to do that. Uh, this ma makes it somewhat harder to, you, to create plugins um, for this system using only D code, uh, which is something that I would like to support. Um, but currently, that's not possible. Again, this is something that's being worked on. Um, Third point is some current complica compilation programs with GDC. Uh, GDC is the decompiler based on uh, the GNU compiler collection. So it uses GCC as a backend, or, or the GCC backend, um, but uses the same front, as, front end as DMD, which is the original uh, D implementation. But DMD itself is, is uh, proprietary, so it's not in uh, Debian. Uh, there's some bugs in GDC 4.6, which is the first version of GDC which supports D2. Um, so yeah, I've, uh, th th those are, I've, I think I, I filed a few bucks on that, but it's not, it's not there yet. There's also something called LDC, which is the, uh, uh, the same front end again, but uses the LLVM backend, um, but that currently is only at uh, D1, so the D2 recent change isn't, hasn't reached LDC in Debian yet. Um, and then yeah, there's some issues with template usage, and I've actually invoked the OM killer a few times by just compiling a single D file, which used a fairly extensive uh, template system. These are issues that may or may not be fixed by Wheezy plus one. The last one isn't really an issue for uh, Debian itself because I do not intend to upload anything that depends on non-free software into Debian, not even into Concept. So if this issue isn't fixed, I mean, if uh, the compiler issues aren't fixed, it's going to have to wait. Um, but at any rate, this could be an issue by, uh, for implementing it. Uh, well, second point, obviously, I could run out of time. I don't know about that, but if any one of you is interested in this, that's where the code is, and help is certainly welcome. Uh, it will also contain, it also contains uh, these slides, by the way, so if you're interested, then you can just get them from the Git repository. And finally, yeah, there might be some issues that I haven't noticed yet, uh, that I have, I mean, it, it's really not a, still a fairly uh, young project, and there might still be some obstacles down the road that I, have, that I don't know about yet. But uh, that will be all, I think.
Right, and that's the end of my presentation. Are there any further questions about the system? Yes, Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, I think this is um, an interesting area that has to be pursued. Um, mm -hmm. I've used Network Manager. Um, I've also had quite a few machines where I've removed Network Manager, which right. I'm sure most people have. Um, the current one, um, it, it, it is helpful for the laptop. Mm -hmm. I do use it on my laptop. Um, someone gave me a USB key um, you know, in another country um, a couple of times, and I've just been able to plug it in and start using it. So Network Manager does have some convenience. Right. Right. Um, and it would be nice to have that sort of convenience in other solutions. Um, but I've also seen some very obscure problems created by a network manager. For example, um, I've, I've tried installing a ganglia monitor, so a monitoring agent on uh -huh. some machines. Right. And I'd find that it would run, but after you reboot the machine, it would not be running. And eventually it, I had a look and it was network manager. Um, right, right. The IP address wasn't there when that particular monitoring agent was starting up and so it wouldn't run. It's been patched since, so Ganglia now works with Network Manager, but mm. I'm sure there are other packages that right. suffer the same way and people pulling their hair out trying to work out why. Um, so the, these are some of the things to think about. One other thing that occurred to me looking at that particular problem is having the, um, I'm not sure what the, term is for this, but for having some sort of a funny IP address like a, on, an I on some sort of funny interface that doesn't really do anything, but just right. having some stupid IP address there that's right. enough for other things to start okay. up. So in, in uh, this system, like I said, uh, an active node is a node that is uh, active and has no uh, parents that are also active, but it is detected by going from the lowest node and working your way up. So if you find a node that is not active and we don't have a cable plugged in there would be a node that is not active and would be somewhere in between, um, then we wouldn't go further. So we wouldn't actually reach that point if we don't have a network cable plugged in or the node is brought down by in software, but it doesn't ha have an IP address. We wouldn't detect that. So I don't think that would be an issue. So, the, so your model of transitioning between the nodes yeah. would actually um, drive the other init scripts, like the order in which they're executed? Okay, no, it would, you would run if up-a and it would then transition the nodes internally. It wouldn't start other init scripts by itself, at least not at this point. Uh, it might eventually come up with some ex extension that does that if that's wanted, but it's not the planned feature at this point, let's put it that way. I do set, set a question about on um, IRC, yes, Ben, I am using lip Netlink. Uh, I am using Netlink to do this. I'm absolutely not using IO controls. Um, I am, however, not very happy with LibNL um, because it's, well, it's got a few wards. It uses a cache to, use to talk to the local kernel because, I don't know, you might run out of bandwidth to your local kernel or something. It's a bit strange. But I'm absolutely planning on using, not, use, on, not using a IO controls, at least not on Linux. Maybe on the FreeBSD, that could be different. Guido, go ahead. So, do you plan to understand or have people write plugins in D to understand every possible type of network interface? Or do you plan to have some kind of uh, scripting system you integrate with? Like, we have lots of like bridges, which enslave stuff, and um, tunnels, and I lots find, and lots of I things. I find that, um, Network interfaces that are different from each other still share some properties. Um, a bridging interface is still a f interface that can be brought up or down. It, it has slave interfaces, so that's something that a regular interface doesn't have, but it still has it, the ability to have an IP address, still has the ability. So those parts don't need to be rewritten. Those parts don't, but the, um, the differences come in between. So that's right. For that's example, right. I plug in the cable, and then I actually want a bridge to be coming right, up right, on the right, HCP, maybe right. on that interface rather right. than the interface. Or so what the the system would have defaults, but if you have a config file that says on this interface, uh, when when it's brought up, just create that other interface, uh, then that's what would happen. It wouldn't. You would be able to disable the default of the HCPing of that interface. That's the plan. Yes, but then do you need an implementation in IPCFG for right. all this kind of no. queer what you would, what you would have is um, 
how this would, would work in the graph is the, uh, blah, blah, blah. Maybe let's go back to this other slide. Right, so you would have nodes that uh, say we have, thank you, we have interface ETH0 and we have interface ETH1. Uh, you would have a node saying I need to create interface bond zero because we're bonding, um, which would depend on we have inter ETH0 and we have ETH1 with a link. Uh, once that is active, then you would have a node above that saying we need to DHCP on this interface, etc. So ETH0, ETH1 would need to be up before bond zero can be brought up, unless you're doing the, the loan balancing thing, in which case one of them would be enough. But so, so you wouldn't get the HCP on the, on, on the one. It, it, how I'm Absolutely. trying to do is the So no, the question in this spe specific case would be, where is the logic to bond the two together? Like in if I down right now, we have basically scripts that right. bridge utils. So, so that so logic on. that logic would be in that particular node, which or in the edges going to the node um, from ETH zero and ETH, ETH, ETH So we one. need a D implementation that understand that bridging and yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay. But it would Thank only need to understand the bridging specific bit. Do you want to ask something, Bill? Or no? Okay. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> uh, okay. That, that answers you. your question. Okay. Yeah. Good. Anything else? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's see. Blah blah blah. Sorry. Yeah, there's some discussion on IRC which I was trying to read, but it doesn't look like look like there's an actual file in uh, actual question in there. So. Nothing else? Yeah, Rene, go ahead. Just wanted to point out that, <coughs> in case you haven't seen it, there is uh, some work on a library that uh, to you to access IP root tools, but not mm -hmm. the tools, but just as an access that is similar to IP root for libraries. That I think quite it's called LibNL, which you're talking about, and I'm actually using it. Okay, I thought it was a different one. I don't remember the name. But it might it might be a different one. In that case, I would be interested. If so, if you can write that down and, and or figure out what it was and, and let me know, that's good. If it's LibNL, I'm already using it or well, trying to anyway. <laughs> uh, anything else? Anyone else? No more questions. No, nothing on IRC. Right. Then I will thank you for your attention and see you later.